Okay, so we're looking at a reading about Kant's views on human sexuality. And I think this is a good place to start when we're talking about um, philosophical views on sexuality because Kant in many ways represents the uh, traditional or maybe conservative position on this. Um, that is a traditional religious perspective. So Kant was very religious and what we get in Kant is a kind of rational defense of traditional, maybe religious values regarding sexuality. So those values are that sexuality is bad, it's dangerous, uh, sex is for children, not for pleasure, um, those types of things, and uh, sex outside of marriage is wrong, masturbation is wrong, gay sex is wrong, things like that. Okay, so. Uh, Kant's view, um, he uses his framework, obviously, um, of his, you know, his well-developed sort of moral theory to argue or to show what's problematic about human sexuality. So if we remember back to Kant's moral theory, Kant talks about an action being wrong if it uses another person as a means to an end. So Kant's basic claim here is that uh, sexuality or sex what happens in sex is that one person is using the other person as a means to an end. So again, if you remember, Kant doesn't say it's wrong to use another person as a means to an end, but he says it's wrong to use someone merely as a means to an end. So on um, this view, on Kant's view, uh, sexuality is this thing that um, it's sort of, and also remember thinking back to Kant's moral views, Sexual, uh, morality is very much tied up with rationality. They're kind of one the same thing, right? So if morality and rationality are tied up, then sexuality is also is going to be in sort of opposition to this sort of morality. On one side, you've got morality and, and um, rationality. On the other side, you've got sexuality and passion and emotion, right? So this goes back to a very ancient dichotomy either between like the body and the soul, you can find this in Plato, other ancient religions, or the uh, dichotomy between the passions, or the emotions, and reason, right? So there's this sort of natural contradiction. Um, rationality and morality constrains the emotions, our animal self, and sexuality is in many ways the embodiment of the animal self, the most powerful emotion. So. Kant says that moral, uh, sexuality makes us use other people as a means to an end, essentially. Um, he has some uh, quote about how it's like you suck the juice, like you're sucking the juice out of a lemon and you discard it when you're done. So on Kant's view, um, sexuality is this very bad thing. It makes us use other people as a means to an end. And in a sense, makes us in a sense because it subverts our reason. It subverts our moral capacity subverts our capacity to care for other people as objects and of themselves, right? You And it's not a, uh, you know, in modern language, the term objectify is most commonly used in sexual contexts, right? So women are objectified by advertising or pornography or um, objectified by men when men stare at them when they walk by or things like that. So this notion of objectifying someone for sexual purposes is um, one that's fairly common, and Kant, that ultimately goes, that notion kind of goes back to Kant. I mean, he says it's wrong to treat people as mere objects, right? It's wrong to objectify people in that sense. Uh, so for Kant, um, marriage is the antidote for this uh, situation, right? So it's wrong to treat people merely as a means to an end, but when you get married, you're essentially committing to take care of that person, right? For better or for worse. So I'm sure, okay, so sex makes us treat each other as objects, but we're not treating each other merely as objects because when we get married, what that's forcing us to do is it forces you to t treat the other person not merely as an object. Okay, I can't just have sex with this person when I want to. I also have to take care of them through sickness, through health, through changing circumstances of life. And that's the idea that marriage is this kind of protective force against the kind of like a, a dam that holds in check the um, base instincts of sexuality, right? It makes them acceptable, makes them uh, workable within a framework of a realm of ends, you might say, within a framework, if you think about Kant's other formula. 
So it ensures that we don't treat people merely as a means to an end. So that's essentially Kant's view on human sexuality and marriage. Um, Kant also has views on um, things like masturbation. He thinks they're morally wrong, right? Um, so part of Kant's argument there is that we shouldn't treat ourselves merely as a means to an end. So when we talked about Kant's theory earlier, we talked primarily about treating other people as merely a means to an end. But Kant also thinks it's wrong to treat ourselves as merely a means to an end. Um, and sex, if you're having sex with yourself, in the case of masturbation, you're treating yourself as merely a means to an end. What is the end? Well, the end is pleasure. So that's a little bit of a foreign concept to us. Um, and Kant has an example of South Sea Islanders. Their behavior is morally wrong because they just kind of lounge around on the beach all day and drink, eating coconuts or whatever. Um, and they don't do anything to uh, improve themselves. Um, so, ignoring uh, racist elements of that characterization, um, Kant thinks it's wrong to uh, just sit around all day to engage in activities merely for the sake of pleasure. So that includes sexual activities, but it's also going to include something like television, right? So Kant would not be a fan of our modern culture, consumerism, television, video games, etc., etc. Um, sort of self-indulgent uh, lifestyles in which we're not, we're using ourselves merely as a means to an end. Um, pleasure, we're not pursuing our own moral perfection, right? So we have a duty to pursue our own moral perfection on Kant's view, and pleasure subverts that. Um, so some of these ideas are a little old-fashioned, although I think they're also worth considering, in that modern sort of secular morality does, I think, need to incorporate some notion of um, how we have some general moral obligation. I think we've probably in terms of secular morality, certainly in terms of practice, modern day consumer culture, we don't have a, a strong sense or a grounding or a notion that we are morally responsible to make the world a better place. I mean, some people feel that and they do work very passionately for that. And some people dedicate their whole life to that. Um, but it's more up to an individual choice rather than a sort of socially recognized duty to make the world a better place in some way or another. Although the idea that you have a duty to your own moral perfection isn't incompatible with sometimes using yourself for pleasure. So there's something there, I think, lurking in the background, but Kant's framework, at least to modern sort of secular um, ears or secular perspective of morality, is a little lacking because we don't think it's wrong to use ourselves for pleasure, at least under some context, some of the time. Um, okay, but that's his basic idea. And summarize, Kant thinks sexuality is a dangerous force needs to be constrained by marriage. If we don't constrain it, it's this powerful emotion. It'll subvert our rational moral capabilities, make us treat other people merely as a means to an end, suck like we suck on lemons and spit them out. And so obviously there's something there. Um, again, this is kind of the traditional view of morality. Um, Kant being a Christian, being very religious and trying to offer a rational defense within his framework. And there's something there. Uh, how far that gets us is... Uh, interesting question whether Kant is partially right, completely wrong, or completely right is an interesting question worth thinking about. Okay.